So I'm back on Careers in Discovery with Hazel Jones of Enhanced Genomics. Hazel, welcome to the show. It's good to be here. Fantastic to see you. Um, we always start with a little bit about what you're up to now. And uh, obviously, you've recently stepped into the, the role of CEO at Enhanced Genomics. Mm -hmm. Really interested to talk a bit about the company, first of all, and, and what you guys are up to, where you're at. Uh, and yeah, tell us a bit about tell us a bit about what you do. OK, yes, yeah, so I'm CEO of Enhanced 3D Genomics. So it's fundamentally a platform company, um, but actually it's the 3D genomics we're interested in and the data around that. Uh, and just to explain that, so the 3D genomics is the interactions between um, the enhancer regions in the non-coding genome and uh, the promoter on the genes. Mm. And put more simply, it's if you can imagine uh, your DNA is a ball of spaghetti in the nucleus and there's lots of touch points, it's those touch points that really drive the function of the cell. So all your cells in your body have the same genome, but your immune cell has a different 3D genome to your cardiac cell or your brain cell. So it right. does a different function. Um, so it's really exciting to understand the non-coding genome because that's actually 98% of the DNA of the genome. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously in the last 20 years, we've seen, you know, we've gone from discovery of the first human genome that costs, you know, a billion and took several years. So the fact now that we can use, you know, it as a diagnostic test in the yes. hospitals and on clinical trials. So we're really unlocking um, that additional data uh, and enabling its use actually both in drug discovery so we can identify novel targets in different diseases, so we're disease agnostic, um, but we can also use it for patient stratification to a finer level than, you know, some of the information that's used at the moment. Um, so we spent the last two, two years really getting the platform right and the tech and being able to do the bioinformatic analysis of the data that's coming off. And now we're in that exciting bit of applying it to the different biology um, questions and yeah. you know, working in collaborations, both with academic and big pharma, to show the power of that. And actually, we've had some exciting data this week to show we've really accelerated um, doing that target identification you know, in a certain disease area. And, and we've worked with a collaborator that's sort of taken two years to get to you know, 10 reasonably novel targets that they're interested in. And with our technology, um, we got to a, a similar number, but in three weeks. So right. the Fantastic. potential of using this data and integrating it, obviously, with a lot of the buzzwords like AI, um, you know, really is going to unlock that power of the genome sequence. Yes, I see. And as you say, there's um, been much more work done on the non-coding genome over the last several years. And, and I guess, I, you know, a, a group of companies that are really focused on understanding it. Um, how much of it do we understand at the moment? How far along are we? <laughs> yeah, so some bits really in depth. So there is mechanisms where if you you're looking at one gene, you can do the fine mapping down, and it, and typically um, you probably get between five and and twenty enhancers. So for every of the twenty two thousand genes in your genome, they all have those, and our technology allows you to see all of that. So we're mm -hmm. really going after that data side so we can understand it, but it can already be used. And, and actually some of our previous data um, hit the news a few weeks ago in, I think it was macrophages, because they've been able to do one of these distal regulated SNPs, um, had then to a target gene, and therefore you understand the disease mechanism, which helps, like we said, with stratifying patients or potentially right. looking for, for novel drugs. So it's getting out there, but you know, it's, it's the it's the totality of what we can do i think that's really amazing yeah yeah and just the understanding that there are other causes or other factors that identify these diseases or identify these characteristics of patients that kind of thing that um can give you different angles to find targets is yeah is, and, and the, the thing that fascinates me is is again how how many differences you can see in that 3d okay. Profile. So, um, you know, we can tell the differences between T cells and B cells in the immune system, which again, you can by a lot of different sort of biological ways. But we can see the difference between a T cell and an activated T cell. And actually, then we can look at those profiles in the disease. So at the moment, we're looking at, at lupus and multiple sclerosis. But, you know, you can start to really differentiate even a big class of diseases by the different profiles that you find in a patient sample. Yeah, I see. OK. Interesting. Mm. And then in terms of where you're spending your time, Hazel, um, you obviously joined the company as COO, uh, I guess, coming up to a year ago now, mm. uh, recently made the transition into the chief exec role. Um, 
has it been very different? How, how have you found that move? Um, I guess it's not so different. I was actually only six weeks in the COO role before oh, okay. an interim um, CEO. And then yeah. you know, more recently, I've been given the position permanently. Uh, and I think it sort of tracks back to, you know, almost that career. So I started my career in biotech in Cambridge Antibody Technology. I've been in and out of different organisations, but the majority of it's been spent in Big Pharma, AstraZeneca. And it was just wanting to be a bit closer to that science, a bit closer mm. to see the decision. So I knew I wanted to come back into biotech and took some time last year to think about it. Um, my recent roles have been more of those operational ones. I very yeah. organized. I'm a, a, a planner, which, you know, is very useful in business. And so the COO was a, an obvious choice for me to sort of um, go into. Yeah. Um, and I think after a couple of weeks here, it was clear that the the platform has has had that technology developed it's very very strong the ip is good we've got a second generation platform coming out we had a lot of use cases in the the biology sort of arena but actually getting those to be um robust and be interested from big pharma was the step that's needed so that's mm. really where we focused for the last six months and changing our sort of narrative to being um, a data company that can really accelerate drug development, both in you know that early stage with the targets, but also in the biomarkers, as opposed to a platform company that's you know really cracking that that code in the non-coding genome. Um, so it, the application's the same, but it's a it's a different narrative around it. Right, I see. Okay, so exciting times now. You've focused down and yeah, definitely yes. Excellent. Well, look, I'd really like to talk about your career as a whole and your path through it. As you say, you know, you started out as a scientist, you moved into more operational roles, biotech, pharma, lots of variety in there. So I'm sure we'll get into all of that. Um, yeah, and it's nice in the fact that I guess if you go to LinkedIn, it looks like a really nice, smooth path. And I've, <laughs> I've, I've done all this amazing planning and, you know, sometimes it, it's not quite like that. So I'll give you a few of the quirks along the way as well. Fantastic. I look forward to those. Um, but take us back to the beginning, first of all. So you you trained as a biochemist originally, but why science? Well, why science? I think it's one of those why, things. Yeah. It, it comes from I don't know what comes first, the passion or the the you know <laughs> the, the being good at it. So it's definitely driven from those school years that it was something that I was very interested in, and therefore you spend more time in it, and therefore you you're particularly good at it. Um, did look at medicine, and my parents, you know. Mm first generation you need they were yeah you, you've got to be a doctor you've got to go and do medicine and I spent a bit of time with a GP and I spent a bit of time in surgery where I nearly fainted and went I'm not sure the medicine's the right way for me um <laughs> and then you know did that digging on my own to find pharmacology courses so my undergrad was pharmacology right um did a project in actually cancer research as as part of that and, and decided to do a PhD then in in biochemistry so very much focused um around uh, a drug it was um mm -hmm. you know and, and do, doing that sort of investigation it was a drug that was very active and we didn't really understand the mechanism so that right. mechanistic piece of you know understanding disease and placing the drug in the right places has always interested me um and um then moving to london um i actually got my first job by writing on spec uh, okay you know, and again, it looks like it's a nice transition, but the reason was my now husband had proposed and moved the, de the night before he moved to London. Ah. <laughs> so it was, <laughs> it was not driven by total choice, um, but I managed to end up in a, a very small biotech called Zenova that was looking at multi mm -hmm. distance and had a great two years there, you know, get, doing that transition from academia into, okay, what is a drug project and how yeah. do they run? Yeah. And, and what were your early memories of that transition into biotech and into industry? Um, it, for me, it was actually quite smooth. We were um, actually um, in a university setting. We were actually on Brunel and head office, so where the labs were. Um, we were a small team, so there was, mm -hmm. was only about 10 of us um, working on that real biology mechanism piece. Um, a little bit of a shocker on their sort of nine to five and, and actually <laughs> someone at the end of the week wants to report into a project team of what you've actually done. Right. Yeah. Um, but for me, yes, a, a great start and understanding, you know, more of the drug development and, and what's required as opposed to being an academic where you can, you know, follow your nose on what you're interested in. Yeah, of course. 
and and then that eventually led you to a position at Cambridge Antibody Technology, as you said. We've had a lot of CAT alumni on the show. <laughs> There's a lot of us around. Uh, <laughs> it's a really, really close network in Cambridge, so that's great. Uh, and actually, I was telling someone else a story. So um, it, it was it was great. I moved, I think it was in 2002. And when I went uh, around sort of my various peers and, and mentors, um, most of the, the information I had back was, no, that's a really ridiculous move. Antibodies are never going to be drugs. Right. Yeah. OK. So I went with some trepidation in the fact it was a great position. I was taking a step up quite, you know, early in the career to build a team around oncology, um, biology and, and those mechanisms. Uh, and, you know, everything I saw from the interview and everything and heard it was very exciting. But, you know, if you look back now, you can say, oh, that, that was amazing. It, it, it was slightly luck and um, mm -hmm. a risk on my point of view, because me and my husband moved over to Cambridge. So he gave up his postdoc and then was made redundant two days before he started his new job. So, right. you know, like I say, it looks smooth, but there's all these bumps that happen along the way. Um, and I, yeah. I still remember it very fondly. I'm sure if you've had alumni on here, you know, that experience was amazing both on the pace but also um just being very integral to actually what they were trying to deliver it was it was i think around 150 when i joined okay. um very tight you know they had a, a lot more in respiratory uh, and that sort of thing but it, it was great to be part of that journey yeah absolutely and i'm fascinated by this because the, the you know that company has had such an impact on the sort of uk biotech Yes. ecosystem you know both in terms of what they actually did but also then what the people who work there have gone on to do and I'm just fascinated by what you saw there that you think you know what do you think made it as successful as it was what were the things that that stood out to you um there's two sides I think there's the the culture and being part of it um mm. and you know, I wasn't very senior at the time, but, you know, I felt I was updated and it's it's been interesting since I now know Sean Grady and AZ and I've heard some of the stories, you know, as it went along and what AZ was thinking from from the other side. But um, being in, in CAT was, uh, it was like part, being part of a big family. Yes. Um, and they were training you up as that sort of scientist and person, you know, there was a lot of investment in you personally in that respect. Um, and the the systems that were around the science was driven by passion and excitement as opposed right. to like a real delivery piece um and i think i don't know why it's so i don't know whether part of that training then enables you to to grow you know i i really feel i grew up there as a scientist my scientific training was there you know and and they made a lot of big bold decisions when they were still actually quite small um, so that belief in, you know, if you know the science and you believe that's the way you should go, I think has stayed with a lot of us. And that's why, you you know, I can now count myself in one of those, the number of CEOs around Cambridge yeah. that come from that that team. And it, it's impressive. Yeah. Yeah. Because a lot of companies today even, you know, talk about being led by science and led by data. And, you know, some of them are more committed to that than others. Right. <laughs> Um, but but they were at Cat, you yes. feel. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And the discussion was have. So you you know, you you have the the exciting discussions, but also the very difficult discussions. So, you know, it was it was everything you got exposed to. You weren't, you know, in the lab doing something and someone else was making this decision. So but I think yeah. that's I I don't know, that's true of a lot of biotech, but yeah, I think I think so. I think, um, you know, it's difficult to balance those things, isn't it? And, mm -hmm. you know, particularly as you grow, if you go quickly, um, keeping keeping sort of your your hand on the wheel and, and steering in the right direction can be a challenge. Um, I, I remember fondly, it was, uh, I hated them to start with, we had Friday morning lab talks, which okay. was basically the whole company in the room, obviously clearly got bigger over years. Yeah. Um, but it was that opportunity to present what you were doing to everyone um but it it was it felt collaborative and it was a night you know it was right i can go there first and say something before going you know to a, a big governance meeting or maybe going out externally um and uh, uh i don't know whether you've spoken to john elvin he, he always had the questions and he always you know it, it didn't matter whether it was 
a quite simple question or very difficult you just want to ask it and that encouraging that audience participation and you know I'm asking it because I'm interested in it not because I want to put you in a difficult spot um, so it, it does come back to culture which it, again is discussed a lot now and obviously I want to recreate some of that yeah yeah um, I, I don't I don't know what the magic source is though unfortunately <laughs> fair enough fair enough um, but you were there, you know, you were there for a good chunk of your early career, uh, yeah. about 10 years all in with the transition into Medimmune and, and uh, everything that happened there. Did it change a lot when it became part of Medimmune, do you think? It changed as it grew, um, you know, partly that was numbers, partly because obviously we're trying to work collaboratively with teams that, you know, were across the yeah. pond. Um, it was different. I mean, again, and I, as you, you know, I was getting older and taking on more responsibility. So then it was, you know, looking at the projects, ensuring that we had the right balance, doing budgets, you know, talking to our counterparts that were, you know, imagine managing similar sized portfolios. Some of it worked really well and was right. really exciting. And some politics got in the way on occasions, sure. which is yeah. sort of anything of, of that size. Um, but I think they would like to think there was give and take from both sides. You know, they they started doing much more um, open offices, which obviously builds that collaboration. Um, and, you know, eventually we got into that working relationship and had an amazing portfolio of both small molecules and antibodies. Um, and that's quite an accomplishment. So, yeah, it, it's nice. It's just nice to go. In. I was lucky because I didn't change site. I changed buildings quite a lot. Right. Yeah. Park, but I got to experience all of that um, in different ways. So, and I think because there were multiple connections, both in the first case with AZ and then with Medimmune, you you learned that some of them were very easy and very good, and I'm still in touch with some of those people. Yes. And then some of them, be it because of the science was difficult or the project wasn't getting the support because we're not being driven by the science, then it, it yes, there were it was more difficult. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. And then, you know, 10 years is a good stint anywhere. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I think, you know, it's it's typically a period at which you sort of start to assess where you're at and think about what options are and things like that. And, you know, um, you then went and joined what on the surface of it would look like a very different type of organisation in cancer research. Mm -hmm. Tell us a bit about that move. So I, I sort of did a sidestep more. So can, cancer research, the CRT, the technology drug discovery yeah. bit, was more like the original CAT. So it was a small organisation focused on drug discovery, a lot of it building alliances with biotech or pharma. Right. Um, they really use my collaborative skills in, in that piece of being able to go out, talk to pharma, and then go out and talk to an academic and somehow get them to agree in the middle. Um, it was also interesting for me of taking a step up and so going a little bit out of my comfort zone of you know including target id validation and everything like that and so it's that sort of wider remit um and going from small large molecules antibodies back to small molecules so right. and the, you know the drug discovery pipeline is the same and now lots of people do do the large molecule small molecule mix but at the time it was quite different uh, and we did manage actually to bring some biologicals um, into the the um, into CRT. Um, and then I had a, a great opportunity sort of after doing that for two years. Um, the Combinations Alliance was part of the CRUK yeah. sort of head office, one of their um, big sort of collaborative projects with industry, but looking at phase one trials. Um, and so I was able to step up on that, again, bringing that collaborative style that I'm very used to of going, right, we've got one person over here that needs this, and we've got the 17 ECMCs, which is the Experimental Cancer Medicine Centre, so all the phase right. one units that want to deliver some trials with this person and, and sort of matching them up. Um, but with that, the science was relatively OK, but understanding setting up a phase one study and everything that <laughs> comes with it was, again, a massive yeah growth and learning phase for myself which puts you in a really good position as a drug discovery drug development when you've been able to do a little bit in both camps yeah absolutely that's one of the things i was going to ask actually is was that kind of your first real exposure to clinical research um yes i've done a little bit in metamune in the facts and, and um you know preparing those inds but it was very much and they don't, don't do it so much now but you sort of go from discovery into development and it was almost yeah. like throw and then depends whether they want catch actually now now in most organization that's a continuum rather than a 
one organization part of an organization handing off um, yeah. to have that experience and also just just what I was exposed to because actually um, the um, CR UK drug development office uh, did a lot of phase one trials with pharma themselves so I was you know doing the partnership piece but I understood a lot more of you know the the data management the setting up the what is needed very operationally as opposed to oh you know this is a really exciting drug we should put it into patients and it's, right. it's got to be safe the tox package has got to be you know so I think most of my changes have been to enable learning from my side which gives me that lot that yeah. wider perspective yeah absolutely and a lot of the people that listen to this podcast are you know drug discovery scientists or they're leading drug discovery programs or that kind of thing what do you think would be useful for them to know about clinical studies that that might help them to do the right kind of research to develop the right kind of data that kind of thing i think that you can't beat that just the experience of being right. in there doing doing that so though you know i wasn't doing the setup there i was managing people that were sort of doing the operational piece so you have to you have to understand all the documentation and everything like that. And you, you've really got to get in the weeds to have that appreciation. I've also, um, I also did a secondment for a year at AstraZeneca, AstraZeneca into digital health. Right, and that, yeah. that was a similar thing. So it was looking at using all the data that's out there to increase numbers into recruited for clinical trials. And that can be anything from the electronic health records that are very different in the NHS to they are in Europe yeah. to obviously but um and some of the data from companies like ourselves which can be very useful for pulling people in um and you can identify them but the link between actually identifying them getting them to a center that's running a trial that's you know really useful to them and actually then managing to bring them into the trial um is very difficult and, mm. and you know you get more appreciation, but I think it's another thing that you have to go down into the weeds and do one slice of it so you can see how it matches with it. You know, you don't have to spend your 20 years in it to understand, but right. I did a year and I came out so much more knowledgeable of just how difficult clinical trial recruitment is and the numbers are incredibly low. So yes. I think it's down below 10% apart from oncology in the UK, which is really driven by CR UK being such a good advocate. Mm -hmm. uh, of doing those and, and as we move forward you know we want those numbers to increase because you know the way to get best molecules through is you need the people in the trials um but for people in the careers i think it is it's having that varied approach you know either to different disease areas or yeah. you know very early in target id and then some clinic and it's it's hard to know where they're going to come from Right. You know, I don't didn't plan. I knew that I wanted at some point to put clinical in my, you know, in in my CV so that I'd have that experience. Um, and I think it's looking for those opportunities, talking to yeah. people in those areas, because, you know, there are usually projects where you can, you know, make a difference and, and learn something new. Yeah, absolutely. And that sort of seeking of new experiences. Uh, do you think that's something that came naturally to you? Did you have to push yourself to do it? What? Is that part of your your makeup, do you think? I think it's a little part of my makeup. And I think I got good feedback from it in the early career. In yes. the fact, you know, when you, you push yourself and you do something different and then it's like, oh, now someone's come back to me and it, it's following on. Um, I think there's, there's I think there's a diagram where you have your um, your comfort zone. I um, can't remember what the second then you go into your panic. And the more you push out right. of it, the, the more likely are. But it's it's once you've done it and you haven't had any negative effects or the negative effects aren't massive which is what yeah. you sort of think in your imposter syndrome i couldn't possibly do that because i'm going to drop all the balls um that then you're encouraged to do it again and again um so yeah yeah i think there's a little bit of determination and wanting something but there's a, another thing of actually when i've been throwing myself in the deep end okay i just need to keep reading to learn about this and it will eventually feel better yes yeah we often see this with people when they they move countries or move locations you know the first move is the big one psychologically even if it's not very far it's just no i couldn't possibly do that because and then as yeah. soon as you've made that one move all the other moves become so much easier because you realize actually it's probably going to be okay <laughs> 
Yeah, so I think there's also, so I have three kids as well, so there's always, right. you know, like how it all affects everyone else, and it's just like, okay, I can do it here, and now I can't do it over here, so that was another reason to have six months off. Yesterday I had um, uh, Josh doing A-levels and Luke and Rhiannon doing GCSEs, and I just couldn't pile on top of that my level of stress at work. <laughs> just like, this, this household is not going to survive. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I can see that. <laughs> the timing is is also, um, but and then then taking the opportunity when it comes. You know, I, I did come into this wanting to learn about biotech mm. again, so that I could take a CEO role. Um, and now I'm doing it and learning as I go, and I've got you know some great support around me, and that that's important too. Yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned this at the top of the conversation that that sort of getting back to biotech was one of the key drivers for you because you you spent time directly before this at AstraZeneca, of course, which is yes. very much the other end of the scale. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us about that part of your your career. So so if all and I think you speak to anyone from Cat, they will hark back to those days and and what right. we actually have as a great it's like. Is it just because, you know, you 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 are going down the pub after work, you know, that part of it, that's where we felt we did some of the growing up, or was it truly amazing? Mm. Um, and then, you know, I've had several different roles in AstraZeneca, you know, that I say, you know, I've enjoyed thoroughly, and then there's always some politics in there because that's just big, for, you know, a big organisation, you find it in any yeah. industry. Um but I think it was coming back to something and really shaping something from the start um, and being able to, you know, I, I spent a lot of my career planning where that next stage is. So I learn all these skills. Yeah. And now I need to apply all the skills. And yeah. although you can do that in big pharma, you're turning a tank around. And there's lots of other people that, uh, you know, have incredible expertise um, whereas, you know, coming into a small organisation like this, I have some unique expertise. I have another, you know, couple of members of SLT that are very different to me. So we make a, a good team. And then we've got some incredible scientists, you know, both on the biology side and the bioinformatics and actually driving that from a platform and some exciting science like the 3D genome to we want to change healthcare. You know, that's a 10 year window in, in yeah. doing that. Uh, and really maximising the potential out of that by collaborations, which I, I, you know, absolutely love driving forward. Yeah, absolutely. So you found yourself in a place, as you say, perhaps not entirely by design, but that that kind of brings all of those things together. <laughs> and and I think this point around, we obviously talked about the sort of potential in drug discovery of the sort of work that you're doing, but I think this point around patient stratification is really important as mm -hmm. well. Because Yes, we want to drive enrollment into clinical trials, but it's also about enrolling the right patients, right? And, um, you know, we're seeing much more that early stage research companies, biotech companies are using, particularly using bioinformatics to analyze clinical data to sort of start to drive that end-to-end -end mm -hmm. understanding. Um, but this could be, you know, if people can get this right, this could be a real shift in success rates, a real shift in cost of drugs. You know, there's a huge amount of impact that could come on the back of it, right? Yes, and it's it's trying to make sure we're following all that potential. Um, yeah. And it it is difficult. So you know, you look at the different AI models in drug discovery and the and how the information is used. It's what is that critical element? Um, there's a piece that sort of needs solving, which is sharing the data. So you know, we can really take advantage of whole genome sequencing, but it is in hospitals, it is with academics, it is mm -hmm. with, you know, it, we're doing different collaborations to access that uh, and really drive it forward to show the potential. Um, and then it is making sure that we're connecting with the right people that can make it happen. Uh, and so some of the biotechs are really investing in drug discovery and new modalities, which is absolutely yeah. fantastic we need for patients. What we're going down more is creating that database. So we call it our 3D genome atlas. Yeah. That we sh we can then maximise what's happening from it. So we can work with the pharma partners for identifying novel targets. Okay. We can work with the diagnostic companies for trying to pull that information apart. Um, at the same time as taking the technology forward to make it easier and faster to do this sort of analysis. So, you know, it goes back to the genomes being around for 20 years. But, you know, you can now go to companies and get your own genome done. 
you know, what does it tell you? Well, it'll, it'll give you some risk factors for disease. The work we've done internally now using that non-coding bit in the 3D genome is that we can improve the accuracy of those. Okay. Um, you know, because we're using that non-coding genome as well as the genes, but we need to do that across all the different disease areas. You know, we're only a little company at the moment, so we've got to get this next bit really right as we scale yeah. and work with the appropriate people. That means then, you know, the whole community can benefit as well as everything else that's happening, you know, alongside. Yeah, absolutely. And as you say, you know, proving the approach and then expanding it is is important, right? And there's so much you could do. Very much so. Focused. Yes, that's why Paul keeps saying, focus, what, what, what yeah. are we actually going to deliver in the next sort of six months? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I hear that a lot around the industry. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, and I think, uh, you know, typical scientists, we are interested and passionate and it's, you know, you, you want to change the world. Right. But you have to do it sort of one patient and one disease at a time. And this is a perfect bridge to my next question. Thank you very much. It's like I gave you them in advance. <laughs> but that that sounds like maybe one of the lessons that you've learned over the years uh, is around sort of, yes, tempering, not tempering that vision necessarily, but bringing it to a practical place where what's the next step is, is kind yeah. of the key bit. Um, I, it, yes, on. definitely. So it is, you know, you can have those big strategic plans and dreams, um, but the only way you're going to get there is actually what is the first step. So actually yeah. having that conversation and then it's all delivery. Yeah, it's, you know, you can. It, it's really, really difficult, particularly when we're talking to collaborators at the moment, because we're like, oh, we've got this big three year plan and we can get to know this and this. And it's like, OK, now step backwards. What is the first, you know, sample or biomatics analysis that we're going to do that's going to give us something that you can make? And it's the decision making. I think that comes a lot from the training in AZ, mm -hmm. particularly as you see the big governance board going up that actually if you're going to a phase three and someone's making a hundred million pound decision, you've got to have good data that right. backs up that decision. And that sort of falls all the way back to, you know, even committing to a drug target in the first place. Um, and, you know, it's, it's already out there and being published how much genomic data, you know, underpins the success rate in drug discovery. I think it's at least twice as success likely to have right, that okay. success. You know, we think we can layer on top of that. AI has the ability to go out and, and find all that information and bring it so you're not, you know, reliant on, you know, what where I was a scientist and finding those papers, you know, by actually do, doing a search, you know, AI will deliver them to your door every day, every week, or, you know, whatever you you would like. And not just, not just locally, you know, on a global yeah. level, there's a lot more information coming out around the world now that you have to keep on top of. Yeah, absolutely. And do you think that maybe, and I mean this in a positive way, sort of increases the onus on people who are running early stage companies to really understand that long term? Because, you know, you will know this as well as I do. There's lots of biotech companies do really good science and then realize there's not really a need for it way later than they should, right? <laughs> it's definitely having the discussion so you know what you're after. And yeah. um, we're having, you know, if we take that early stage at the moment, we're having that balance between identifying novel targets which we know our technology can do we've we've got evidence of that now but you know for my time in pharma you know everyone's doing that by different means it's more yeah. defining the biological mechanism of a, a set of targets and prioritizing which one to take forward because you know it's likely to be superior because of the mechanism or there's a you know you've already got that patient marker so it's a simplified hopefully faster route to to clinic yeah. and, and eventually the patient so we're learning all the time um, and it's being disrupted all the time by technologies like ours and AI but also by the change in the sort of patient pathway so as new targeted okay. drug, drugs get to the market then they get it different you know particularly in oncology the ones that were in in sort of stage four have come forward and they're changing they're really changing um you know early diagnosis so right. it's a constantly changing field and understanding that and sort of planning going okay that's in phase three so in another you know maybe two three years that that disease is going to have a change in pathway yeah i see yeah and i suppose there's an interesting balance there between being cognizant of the changes and taking them into account and then understanding well what are the actual underlying principles and what are the things that 
don't and obviously AstraZeneca have done a lot of work around this in particular haven't they mm -hmm. yes definitely and they've all you know they have been driven by the science which which has been fantastic and to be a part mm -hmm. of that but actually it does throw up more challenges so actually when you look at the portfolio and again even a big company has a set budget you have to make very difficult decisions because yeah. it's not like you know three of the projects have fallen over you know very early on because actually you you've got the information now that you've learned from from those mistakes you know even with pk and tox and stuff there's a lot of prediction we can do before even taking those molecules further so it's it's interesting to know you know to to look at those success rate do the analysis but you know very cognizant of what's coming through the clinic now so if we're thinking about targets well these are all going to be on on you know in the patient pathway when we, yeah. we get to take hours through yeah absolutely and then looking back at your career hazel what would you point to as sort of the other key lessons that you've learned along the way that, that have really really helped you progress uh, or maybe the things that you wish you'd known at the start but you know. <laughs> um so i'm always good at volunteering for the not so glamorous jobs because they get me into right. the meeting rooms of you know so understanding what's happening at the next level um and i, I can do it reasonably easy because i'm organized and you know just setting those up so i've always for my boss tried to be that right hand person so that i'm the one that's taken if something exciting is happening when you you hear it earlier right, yeah. so you know that's just the way i've done it um the one thing my husband will probably pull out is just the i think he calls it my hyper focus okay um and you know that differentiate between projects so you know really for the last 10 years i have to jump you know one minute as i'm doing covid and i was doing brexit that you know very boring things and then i'd be in a governance meeting or you know preparing the budget so that ability to do that change very quickly from meeting to meeting and still right. keep spinning plates i think my, my new cso dan says i'm doing it while on a bouncy castle so everything's all a bit a bit more wobbly um I think that hyper focus comes in on also that work life balance. Okay. Uh, so I am prepared to work very hard, but I'm not really prepared to work at weekends unless I'm traveling for work, you know, so it's it's a switch off and a start yeah. um, and, and holidays. And when I'm present with the kids and doing that, you know, I'm present. I took the time to have the time off because I, I couldn't do both. Yes. Um, and it's, I don't think anyone's got that bit solved. I think it's a changing piece. <laughs> is there anything that, that helps you with that? Is there anything you've learned to do that? Because I, I think you're right. I think a lot of people struggle with that separation, particularly now there's so much hybrid and remote working. And uh, Yes, I mean, I, I guess now, now with teenagers, it's, it's, it's that hmm. communication and the shared calendar. And yeah, OK. Uh, I, I I I did did uh, <laughs> not lose my son. We never weren't sure where he was. Um, he turned out to be actually at, at the school open day, which he had told us about. Okay. Uh, and my very helpful son in Thailand said he hadn't seen him. <laughs> you know, so that so that connection is is very important, um, yeah. and being able to do that um, in the right pieces. So you know, I'm I'm very happy and was you know even in the early years to to take the afternoon off because it's the nativity play. Yeah. Because actually, I've just worked till ten o'clock three nights a week, and I have, you know, that's the bit I ha that's the bit they're going to remember. So, you know, prioritizing where it needs to be prioritized. Yeah, yeah, okay. And I suppose then figuring out as well because we've all got too much to do, right? We've all got yeah, lists always. of things that we're never going to get to the end of. So I suppose you talk about prioritizing there. It's also about understanding well, which of these things is important and which are the things that are going to make the difference. Yeah, and it's planning them in the calendar. It's it's giving. Yeah. Them, you know, you can do it the same. You know, the science versus you know the one to one with you know the people you're line managing and and those things. You can you can tweak it over you know sort of weeks, but months. You know, you sort of realise then you're you're losing touch on some of the projects. So, and I think it's that it's a balancing act. Um, and and then I using the electronic things. So. I went to an iPad quite quickly, you know, to take my notes and they've been electronic. So now my OneNote pieces, you know, two minutes before I call into it, I do the search like I did before right. I called in and I had all my notes from what I spoke to Emma. I was like, oh, OK, I've got that. I've got the agenda. 
I'm ready to go and, and they're on my phone now so if I'm in a networking and I bump into someone I think oh I know them it's just okay how do oh yes we were talking about such disease so I think there's a lot of electronic pieces as well that, that help you know I, I can see my home calendar at work so when we're sort of planning I put it in both so yeah that, I think that's a really important point you know tied to the hyper focus stuff you're talking about is that if you are going to be engaged and present in whatever you're doing you have to have ways to quickly pull the information that you need so that you're not spending the end of the last thing preparing for the next thing right yes yes uh, and it's great so I've heard lots of things you know when they you have 45 minute meetings so particularly in you know when you're in big places like Zed, it could be a five minute walk to the next you know to where you're having your next yeah meeting. true um, but it's a little bit of that regrouping and getting ready for yeah. the next next one. Um, and then I, you know, I'm surrounded by a very good team here that that have that information as well. So um, I've got Kishan in the room here that that accompanies me a lot of the time and and has a, a nice big database where we can quickly call up inform information. Fantastic. Um, so making the most of the tools that are there for you. Tools um, and people, yeah. I think it, it, finding the synergy where it and, and it doesn't always work. The the biggest headache <laughs> in my in the moment is, is my dog because my children can look after themselves, uh, but the dog can't be left for eight hours now that we never know who's in and who's not. So uh, fair enough. And the dog's not so hot on the calendar and oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's not working at that at all. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. And I mean, along with the things you've already talked about, um, any last things that you'd like to leave people with or any piece of advice that have been particularly impactful for you um i think it is about having uh the right mentors you know okay. finding those people that's a good thing and um personally i just value networking right just those connection you know the connections from long time ago and and building those but you know i've i've I spent 20 years building up my oncology network and then I've come into a job where I need genomics and investors. So I'm almost right. back to, so right, okay, how do I get out there? How do I meet people? Um, and that's one of my learning styles. You know, I've done enough of the Myers-Briggs and everything else that, that that drip feeding of information is the way then that I sort of absorb and then go, oh, okay, we probably need to go in this direction because, you know, I've heard it from five people. This is a good, you know, these are good people to talk to or that's going to answer this question I've got over here um but people starting out I would say yes networking is key uh, and developing because you you never know you know what your projects might change the science might change or you know yeah. you were thinking about different countries you know I, I recently went over to China with the HSBC um and you know touched base with one of the chief of staff that I'd never met over there right. we didn't actually meet face to face but we did manage a good email chat so it, that those connections are really important yeah absolutely and I suppose to wrap up you told us a little bit about where things are at at Enhanced 3D Genomics um what would you like people to know about what's next um I think it's it's the speed that we hope to move at the ambition that we've now got we you know it's taken me less than six months to fully believe that this could be that what would you call it the ne next dimension in discovery right um, and you know we've been we, so many people are using genomics but it's it doesn't feel like we've had that sort of health breakthrough that it's it's always promised um so really the next step is to consolidate that with the right collaborations with the, the pharma and biotech partners to show and demonstrate what it can do and then hopefully to to scale up that at a speed that doesn't disrupt us but you know really informs you know the research community yeah fantastic well exciting times and we wish you the best of luck thank um, you very much thank you so much for joining us it's been a pleasure